This is Jay's Analysis.com. I'm Jay Dyer. You're listening to my analysis of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, the 1932 dystopia that in many ways is more accurate than George Orwell's 1984. The song you heard coming in was Kore Kazmu with Dream Agent, the excellent sultry tune from Ariel Electron. So check out their stuff if you like that song. One of my favorites, actually. Brave New World. Here we go. We're going to get hardcore. We're going to get deep. Stay with me. My copy includes an introduction, a foreword written by Huxley himself, discussing later his thoughts on the book after its publication. The first place to start in understanding this work is utilitarianism and the utilitarian happiness principle. Huxley is coming from a tradition, the British tradition of imperial empiricism. What is imperial empiricism? Well, from the time of the Enlightenment, the British version of it, we have a set of philosophers, namely John Locke, George Berkeley, Jeremy Bentham, Uh, many others who would roughly fit into the school of empiricism and David I should mention David Hume as well the school of empiricism and utilitarianism and utilitarianism is sort of the ethical corollary to empirical philosophy which is the an epistemic view a view of epistemology that knowledge comes to us solely through sense experience and sense data Naive empiricism is the perspective of scientism. Scientism will grow out of the British empiricist perspective. The economic, sometimes, and ethical position of utilitarianism is the happiness principle, the greatest good for the greatest number of people, supposedly. These are very flawed perspectives, but they flow from one another. So this is why so-called libertarian economics and economic theory flows out of this empiricist model of anthropology and human psychology. It's connected because it recast mankind following the late Middle Ages into a nominalist perspective, out with the metaphysics, out with the universals, out with abstractions, and in with empirical science, data collection, numerics, quantification. That's the old system. The new system is scientism. That's what will develop out of this. So the revolutions are crucial to understanding Huxley's point and Huxley's thought. By these revolutions, he means the beginning of the scientific revolution, which led to economic revolutions, industrial revolution, the Enlightenment, etc. Philosophical revolutions, political revolutions, communism, Marxism, socialism, etc., etc. French Revolution. And the final revolution, to use the terminology of the Fabians and Huxley and Bertrand Russell and the Royal Society social engineers, is the scientistic revolution. That is the final revolution. It is not a revolution to create freedom as it was sold for many centuries. The false banner, the false epithet, the false sloganeering of freedom, greater freedom, democracy. That's not what the penultimate revolution is, as Huxley calls it. What is the final revolution? Well, it is that. It is scientism. It is the penultimate revolution that follows upon atomic warfare, the ability to supposedly create mass destruction. And all of this arises from scientific means that create the final power class of this eminentized eschaton, if you will. That is at least the eschaton of the old world the old way of doing things, all traditional cultures, collapsing into 
the Psi Tech Revolution. That's the final revolution. The complete reorganization of man himself based on the principle of utilitarian happiness. That is the control mechanism. Why? Because it posits man only as a material actor in the world. Only as a material result of material determined processes. No higher faculties, no higher sense, no higher connection to metaphysics. Metaphysics no longer matters. All that matters is pragmatism. Pragmatism is the one school of philosophy that the United States has historically pioneered. And it is that connection to Bacon and scientism and the new Atlantis that America really fulfills in terms of a destiny. So the destiny of America is precisely a scientistic dictatorship. I don't say scientific because it's not really scientific. Now, that may sound controversial, but as we get to the end of Brave New World, you will see that that is exactly the fact. It is not a scientific revolution, ultimately based on science. Science is used, but it's only used when it's useful for certain ends on the part of the technocrats. Science, in truth, is actually very dangerous just like art and that is precisely what we will see in brave new world and why it's not proper to call it science but rather scientism the abuse of the tools of discovering the natural world through such means so that is huxley's point in this forward is that brave new world is a picture a literary picture of the real revolution the final penultimate revolution planned on the part of the social controllers, the social engineers, and the real power structure. Keeping in mind that this was written in 1932, the amount of foresight in terms of technological developments is really profound in this work. Some have claimed that Huxley actually ripped this off from a person by the name of Stanislav Mankowski, Mankiewicz, I forget the exact name of the Pol I believe he's a Polish writer who wrote a, wrote a dystopian film or a, a dystopian novel along the same lines but that is a supposedly a debated topic in the history of literature so whether or not that's true I don't know uh, some have claimed that but regardless it's still amazingly prophetic in what it foresees what does it foresee? It foresees eugenics a eugenics-based state that practices dysgenics, everything will be classified and divided into a strict class system that goes from alphas to deltas. 70% of the female population are sterilized. Each segment of the population has a specific propaganda that's targeted towards it. Each of these Greek enumerated classes alpha beta gamma delta epsilon and it's a society that is drugged with soma the hallucinogenic happy pill that everyone takes is also in a gas form and it's not a repressive society in the sense of physical force this is the point that differs from 1984. 1984 is very much a top-down socialist, uh, fascist, communist, hardcore state where uh, very brutal. Uh, the, brut the brutality of Brave New World is not found in physical force. The brutality is found in the sensuous pleasure of the world state. So there are hatcheries, and the hatcheries are where clones come, uh, originate. The hatcheries are well, where the population originates. No one is born from a womb anymore. In fact, it's bizarre, it's trite, it's laughable, it's comedic to talk about birthing natural. So from the alphas to the epsilons, this, this class structure is 
such that alphas have a lot more freedom and a lot more capabilities. Their genetics are modified such that they have the ability to do things that the epsilons are unable to do. The epsilons are essentially the, the, the stupidest of, of these classes. And everyone wears color-coded outfits, by the way, to signify which caste they are a member of. Mass production is applied to population production. And so population is something controlled scientifically insofar as uh, producers or uh, in the sense of factory work or in the sense of lab work are needed. So there's more or less a clone army, right? So something like Star Wars or Boba Fett's everywhere, the clone army. And there's a total quantification. Uh, social predestination, pure and total quantification in a Rene Ganon sense is, is absolutely applied across the board in totality in the world state predicted in the dystopian text of Brave New World. So the total control of repro reproduction is under the authority of this socialist world state. Everything is very sterile, including the population for the most part. Uh, we will later find out that not every single person in the world state is actually sterilized. But we'll get to that in a bit. But it's important to see that even in the so-called perfect revolution, the lies of the older revolutions of egalitarianism don't apply. So there's no longer any pretense of there being castes and hierarchy. There are. And in the future dystopia, in this setting, no one objects to that caste system, and that hierarchy, precisely because everyone has their place, and everyone has their place because they're happy. And this is what the world socialist dictator Mustafa Mond says in the novel, and what Berk uh, Huxley says in his famous Berkeley lecture is that the reason it's so appealing is that it creates a purely natural physical state of happiness that is the drug soma he even says in the lecture were, were they actually to understand the circumstances and their slavery why they should be up in arms only a state of pure madness would accept such slavery but of course that's the very point isn't it there's something to that effect right that any normal person would see these this setting as absolutely insane and madness. It's a society of madness. But when everyone has been drugged to the point that they will accept any situation as happy, right? You'll be happy in any station in life through soma. Then you've eliminated all possibility of revolution. So the irony here is that the domino effect of revolutions from the time of the Enlightenment and the Protestant Reformation and these various European revolutions sets in motion a long series of revolutions that end in the revolution to end revolutions. Total dictatorship. The end result of Robespierre, Danton, Lafayette and the Marat, the French revolutionaries, is this is this very state, the social dictator state. So everything is is a resource. Everything is is tracked, traced, and controlled. Energy is a resource, and not just energy in the sense of fuel or whatever, but human energy is a resource. Humans are batteries, much in the sense of the Matrix, as we see in the popular film. Alphas are the intellectuals, as we said, all the way down to the Epsilons, who are the lowest labor class. And Huxley says essentially that the Epsilon class doesn't progress in mental maturity past what an, a 10-year-old is. So they're essentially 10-year-olds mentally who are test tube engineered, they're, they're mass produced humans that serve the function of doing the, the labor jobs. So divorce, uh, 
rampant sex. These are all effects that, that Huxley says in the foreword that he foresaw and essentially wrote those into the text. So mass divorce and rampant sexuality uh, would be used as a means to control society. And again, this is 1932. So we're not talking about 1960s documents from the Pentagon. We're talking about Royal Society 1930s documents. That's what we have with Brave New World. And, and Huxley says very clearly, this is not fiction. It's a fictional portrayal of what is to come. The infant nurseries where everyone is created in a test tube and a culture dish the babies are conditioned we learn there's Pavlovian neo Pavlovian conditioning at the decanting rooms and the infinite infant nursery conditioning there the babies are electroshocked so here we have sort of early nascent forms of mind control MK ultra that would later be used with electroshock techniques depatterning this comes into play with infants in 1932 in brave new world amazingly and what this does is this conditions them to accept the social order of brave new world the social order of the world controllers the pavlovian conditioning works because it's done like it's done with dogs but on a mass scale with infants and this does the work of creating and controlling instincts and that's the point is to reduce man particularly the lower castes to completely instinctual creatures but not instinctual in the traditional sense of obeying biological drives and necessities sex food protection self-defense no 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 eradicating all those imprinting and patterning a new instinct which is to simply follow rules, to simply obey the social order. Nature itself is in fact hated and is the enemy because nature is seen as frail. And this is something we've highlighted many times in our analyses of the hermetic view of the great work, which results in transhumanism. For Huxley, transhumanism, which is actually a term coined by the Huxleys, does play into this because we have completely engineered humans these are not normal quote-unquote humans as we would traditionally think of them these are test tube humans these are clones these are people who see sexual reproduction as gross as, as disgusting and a, as a joke so very much but that does not mean this is some sort of monastic chaste society no rather they actually have pedophilia they have youth sex they have rampant sexuality with anyone and everyone uh, more or less in your class I suppose but everyone is sterilized and they take sterilants if they're not sterilized to ensure that you don't have natural reproduction and that's that's the key here and this is what we've seen now this is essentially 2015 so we are in brave new world now uh, we just haven't gotten fully into the standardization of the system that huxley says will come so state conditioning centers control birth and that's what's key and that's what we've seen proposed by the rockefellers by the royal society by the chinese government by all of these different UN population councils Pentagon that is the goal here the end of the family and total collectivism right that that socialist ultimately platonic Republic model of human organization is where we're going everyone is brainwashed in this dystopia through sleep and what he calls hypnopedic engineering hypnopedic conditioning and this is a kind of mind control mk ultra esque sleep technique where you you are patterned according to these certain slogans as you sleep you hear you know you listen to these tapes that repeat over and over these mindless slogan slogans of supporting the government uh but again 
it's also fascinating to note that the class consciousness has never been eradicated. So this is something supposedly from Marx, right? That, that Marx thought was uh, going to end one day in the final revolution. That does not end, right? There's no end to the class system. There is rather uh, the complete scientific regimentation of the class system. And that's the difference here. So everyone just chants mantras. They don't think through. In fact, it's discouraged to think through the mantras that the state gives you during your conditioning period, which is your youth, where you're basically under these mind control facilities for years. And that actually is the public education system that we have now. <laughs> that child conditioning results in operant conditioning, which results in complete control in society. I should stop for a moment and discuss a little bit in relation to the origin of the name before we proceed on to chapter three. The name Brave New World comes from the Tempest, and this is a section of the Tempest, Act 5, Scene 1, where we read, O oh wonder, how many godly creatures are there, how beauteous mankind is, O oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Now there's curious parallels and pre-signifiers, perhaps, of the new world in the Tempest. So it's possible that Shakespeare knew about Magellan's circumnavigation, so he might have speculated about this new world in reference to the possibility of America. And it's these esoteric and hermetic Rosicrucian type image images that appear in The Tempest that link it to Sir Francis Bacon's New Atlantis. So that this comes out of an esoteric magical tradition is what is most interesting. Because Prospero, the character, rules as a kind of artist king. He's the white magus. And he rules this island as an artist king. And the whole question of the Tempest largely surrounds fiction, fantasy, and reality. So very much what I was just discussing with Tim Kelly in our last interview over Esoteric Hollywood. There are tests by illusion and this panopticism that comes into play with the island and the question of nature being harmonized with reason, Prospero's all-seeing gaze, the, these are elements that will, I think, in a way esoterically pre-signify America because America will be more or less the America and the the UK the Anglo-American establishment will be Brave New World that is Brave New World that is the new Atlantis of Bacon not an Atlantis of utopia but dystopia and that's the end result of the scientistic scheme because it's not true it cannot build a utopia that translates into reality it can only build a dystopia as a bad philosophy thus translates into praxis into reality and that's where brave new world comes in because brave new world is that very dystopia it is the new atlantis but it's the new Atlantis that's a nightmare. So a little bit on that had to be said, and, and it's this atmosphere of the long-standing British occult tradition, all the way back to figures like John Dee and the Elizabethan court, astrologers and magi, Bacon, these different esotericists, the Ben Johnson, the John Dunn's, their fascinations with alchemy 
Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen, full of all the same alchemy, Rosicrucian, and esoteric symbology, which I have two or three graduate papers that I've written on that topic. That is the background to Brave New World. And so what I think we see is, because there's a lot of truth in those hermetic traditions as it relates to secret principles in nature. And so what happens over time is that as the scientific process filters out the fiction from the fact in that process, the study of nature, alchemy, what happens is that the metaphysics gets dropped and the resulting dystopia is precisely a result of that dr dropping of metaphysics because it's the final revolution into a completely controlled materialistic atheistic state parallels could be seen in something like the Soviet Union where you have a completely atheistic state Fabianism Fabian socialism is essentially what is in Brave New World. This is the Fabian state. So children are, are sexualized, children are named after various revolutionaries, Bernard Marx, Polly Trotsky, etc. But there's also the blending of capitalism because as we know they speak in terms of the year of our Ford instead of the year of our Lord and at the quasi-Masonic non-denominational pseudo-religious service that everyone participates in, they have a large Model T that is the new form of the cross instead of the T, the Tau of Christianity. The new cross is the T in terms of the Model T Ford. So there's a homage to industrial capitalism as well as homage to Marxism. And this is a revelation from Huxley, a member of this Royal Society itself, behind both of these revolutions, the capitalism and the communism, demonstrating that both of these are controlled. They're two arms of the same dialectic, capitalism versus communism. And that's what Huxley's telling you. There are two roads that lead to the same destination. And that's why the future Fabian state honors both. There's no religion. There's no history. You don't read Shakespeare. You don't read the past. That's all forbidden, forgotten, taboo. And people don't want to read it anyway. History is bunk, is the, one of the phrases. Films and movies are completely sensory based. They have no depth. They have no meaning. They're called feelies. They're very sexual in nature, more or less softcore porn with action and sensory stimuli and overload. That's it. That's the feelies. The theaters. Music is synthetic. It's essentially techno. I'm not dissing techno. I'm, I, I like electronic music quite a bit. But we get the impression that this techno is just merely a computer program. No human creation involved. It's all just pumped out of speakers by computers. That's it. Our Ford, our Freud. Everyone belongs to everyone else. Love is something laughable, something preposterous in this dystopia. Because everyone belongs to everyone else. Love implies possession. That is mine, not yours. Right? That's my wife, that's my husband, that's my child. That cannot exist in a society where everyone belongs to everyone else the supposed collective. There's no emotions because everyone is drugged. The signifying of emotions suggests, the conveying of emotions suggests instability. And this is a society based on stability, not through brute force, but through happiness, through the pleasure principle. Water is controlled and drugged. The Russian technique for infecting water supplies was particularly ingenious, as it is said on page 48. Sterilants in the water, fluoride in the water, 
a reality we see today. Rule by brains and buttocks. Government's an affair of sitting, not hitting. You rule with the brains and the butt, never the fists. So, in other words, you outsmart and you use bodily desires and sexuality to control the masses. You don't control the masses through 1984. Consume, consume, consume. So it's very much a consumer society. It, this is not an anti-consumer society. Another difference from 1984, Eric Blair, George Orwell. This is cloning and Fabianism. Humans are a marketable, consumable commodity, a product. They come out of test tubes. They're like McDonald's creations. Big Mac people, right? Aspartame ideologies. Natural birth, again, as I said, is laughed at. There are campaigns against the past. Muse <clears throat> museums do not exist. There are no books beyond the last 150 years. So, again, this is a significant amount of years into the future. So, in other words, 150 years is still future to us in terms of when this dystopia is taking place. Everyone is euphoric, narcotic, and pleasantly hallucin hallucinant. You have the Lord's, you have Ford's Day instead of the Lord's Day. The sacrament is drugs. And the feely ritual ceremony that you have at your quasi Masonic inter denominational pan religious ceremony that worships the great architect. And what's fascinating, as I mentioned too, is that everyone thinks in their own caste that they're kind of elite, right? Their, their caste is special. And that's the programming and the social engineering targeted specifically for each, each caste. So people will say things like, well, I'm glad I'm not a gamma. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a delta. There's a fake equality that's pushed, even though there's a caste system where obviously people aren't equal. There's a bureau of propaganda. There's a college of emotional engineering. It's basically like living on a state university campus is a good way to put it. What's Brave New World like? Imagine living your whole life on a state university campus. TV is psychological warfare. That's even mentioned. It's a psyop. The feeling picture, not just the moving picture, the feely picture, all created by the propaganda house of emotional engineering. Feely fake TV. News is read by sexy babes, sexy voices, info babes. The soul is stamped out, as Brave New, as Bertrand Russell said, would happen. The soul would have to be stamped out. <clears throat> and Brave, this is the Bertrand Russell system, Bertrand Russell structure. There are mass crematoriums for death. <clears throat> in the sense of if you've seen Logan's run this is portrayed well in that film where everyone participates in euthanasia because it's an honor to be cremated at the state crematorium and they have a nice little ceremony and some some pretty elevator music and you you just drift away as you are shoved into the incinerator and you are used as fertilizer so you you still serve your function to be a human commodity you become fertilizer for the plants in the, in the beautiful happy dystopia and everyone's happy as said many times everyone's happy everyone takes drug holidays your holidays so-called are drug holidays and everyone listens to drug music and everyone takes their pills not just their soma but also their birth control pills if they're not a, mem a member of the sterilized class then you take what's called your malthusian pills and so that's again Mal thomas malthus one of the early progenitors of eugenics the idea of controlling the population all put in place 
in the Brave New World dystopia. The Rothschilds are mentioned. One of the important people is Morgana Rothschild. So all throughout, Huxley's through these names giving you clues, Ford, Rothschild, Marx, Trotsky, etc., etc., as to who the important movers and shakers in global change have been. The service, as I said, the fake church service, the Logan's Run death cult, worships the greater being, the no content, abstract, impersonal being. Not a god, a being. Generic unity is what's worshipped. The liturgy of the fake church, fake state, it's called the orgy porgy. The dancers get ca caught up in the liturgical refrain of the orgy porgy. Orgy porgy, Ford and fun, kiss the girls and make them one. Boys at one with girls at peace, orgy porgy gives release. This is your liturgy. So, <clears throat> everything is conveyed here, and that's what I want to convey to the listening audience, is that everything of the totality of the plan in real world is conveyed in totality in the novel Brave New World in 1932. Everyone's named after a Marxist, and an industrialist, and that is crucial. Everyone is entertained by the most ridiculous, base, low, common, vulgar entertainment. <clears throat> idiocracy. But it's not total idiocracy in the sense of the satire film, because there's a caste system where you still have intelligent people. The alphas in Brave New World are the smartest of the brainwashed classes. And they are, in fact, very brainwashed. That's very important. So in our day, the CEOs, the, the sports figures, the so-called alphas of whatever spectrum or aspect of life we're, we're speaking of, they don't really know, most of the time, the real game plan. They are propagandized. So you don't have feelings, but you do go to feelies. So feelings would suggest social concern, interpersonal concern. That's not allowed, not desired. Feelies are purely sensuous, orgasmic, fleshly, licentious, trigger response, emotion, uh, not, emotion is not the right word, uh, just bodily reaction, right? So, so that, for example, the sexuality in Brave New World is never attached to any emotion. It's just purely a biological action of pleasure. That's it. I'm not going to go too deep into all the characters, but I will a little bit. So you have Lenina, Bernard Marx, John the Savage, Mustafa Mond. These are the main characters. And Bernard is a somewhat questioning but manipulative guy who's interested in getting ahead. But John the Savage lives on a reservation. So what we've come to find out is that there's a reservation of people who still live the old way. There's a whole society and sometimes the alphas from London in the world state, the socialist world state will, will for a whim, for fancy, will visit the island where the savages are, the, the, the specific area where they keep the specimens of the old culture. And 
the Savage Res- Reservation, excuse me, it's not an island, it's in New Mexico. And that we learn that these people are the descendants of the Anasazi, with the, which were a mysterious tribe that disappeared at one time. Where they went, who knows? But they're the famously disappearing tribe. Why Huxley has chosen that, I'm not sure. That would be interesting to try to research. But John Savage is a member of this group. And we come to find out that he still participates in the religious ceremonies of his of his tribe. So he's kind of a syncretistic, uh, natural religion, animism, mixed with a little bit of Christianity, because he, he believes in Jesus, but also these other spirits. <laughs> So he's a representation of the old world, really, is, is what John is, John the Savage. And the reservation is kept like a zoo. And the people in the reservation are viewed like animals. They're, they're zoo animals, relics of an older time that serve a scientific purpose for the socialist world state. And the Malpai reservation is very dirty so it has this messy this this earthy bloody stinky uh, humanness to it that is in stark contrast to the sterile dead uh, white barren uh, technocratic state of London and when Lenina visits the girl interest in the film, <clears throat> she begins to have an affinity for John the Savage. And they decide that they want to <clears throat> excuse me, take John the Savage to London because he's an interesting character. And he'll, he'll be kind of a, 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 a thing of gossip, a, a, a party favor of sorts amongst the London elite, amongst the alphas, being th- this older relic of a, of a character from the reservation. So they bring John to London, to the world state, and John is shocked. So he goes through a period of, of culture shock. Uh, he uh, doesn't understand the, the total collectivism. He doesn't understand the symbolism, the imagery, the barrenness, the drugs, even though in his culture they still had drugs too, so that's a fascinating parallel that still carries over. Drugs never go away. In fact, they become crucial. And the hypocrisy we discover is that the world, one of one of ten world socialist directors, world social controllers, Mustafa Mond is actually John's dad. So Mustafa Mond has an affinity for the ancient world, as we learn of his hypocrisy being the atheist world dictator, because he impregnated John's mom. And Bernard is found out to be a, a selfish pragmatist. Uh, and so what we, what we ha- are left with is John the Savage, who's going to function as a kind of revolutionary in London against this brave new world technocratic state and Lenina his love interest the alpha level female who begins to develop a sexual attraction for John the Savage that goes beyond mere play she actually begins to have an attachment for him they will be set against Mustafa Mond, the world controller, whose hypocrisy becomes evident and who ultimately they will have a showdown with. And that's the most revealing aspect of, of the story that that we'll get to in a moment. But So John is in, in the midst of all this. He doesn't understand the feelies. He's troubled by the religious ceremonies. He's as I said, culture shock. There's only one mention of a bank in the whole book, which is fascinating. The Bank of England is the only thing that's mentioned. 
excuse me, the, the Bank of Europe, excuse me. So we're, we're, we don't see much economics in this book because, of course, economics presupposes individual action for the purpose of uh, profit, gain, monetary exchange, and so forth, which isn't really needed in this world. So banking doesn't actually play much of a role in the future dystopia. <clears throat> But John, while on the reservation, wrote a lot of Shakespeare. So he's constantly quoting Shakespeare. He's, he's remembering things from the Bible, his religious traditions. And he's mentioning these things. And no one in the enlightened tech dystopia knows what he's talking about. They, they laugh at him. They think it's funny. They, they're, they're, it's idiocracy on one level, even though they're very scientifically learned. They, don't, they have no idea what Shakespeare is. They don't know what he's talking about. One of the most important sections in the book, there's two. The first is Mustafa Mann's reflection as he's deciding which texts will be published in science. This is crucial. So the top of the chain in London is deciding which texts will be published in science journals. Does this sound familiar? It sounds just like what the Lancet said uh, a few months ago that half of the world's literature in terms of scientific data is false why that sounds just like brave new world and Mustafa Mann now doesn't it a new theory of biology was the title of the paper which Mustafa Mann had just finished reading he sat for some time meditatively frowning and then picked up his pen and wrote on the title page the author's mathematical treatment of the conception of purpose Telos is novel and highly ingenious, but heretical, and so for the present social order. As it is concerned, it is dangerous and potentially subversive, and therefore, quote, not to be published. He underlined those words. The author will be kept under supervision. His transference to the Marine Biological Station of St. Helena may become necessary. A pity, he thought, as he signed the name. It was a masterly piece of work. But once you begin admitting explanations in terms of purpose, well, you didn't know what the result might be. It was the sort of idea that might easily decondition the more unsettled mind amongst the higher castes to make them lose their faith in happiness as the sovereign good. And to take to believing instead that the goal was somewhere beyond out there, somewhere outside the present human sphere, that the purpose of life was not the maintenance of well-being but some intensification and refining of consciousness, some enlargement of knowledge, which was, the controller reflected, quite possibly true, but not, in the present circumstance, admissible. He picked up his pen again, and under the words, not to be published, drew a second line, thicker and blacker than the first, and then sighed. What fun it would be, he thought, if one didn't have to think about happiness quite a bit packed into that. How often do I critique scientism and the ruse that everyone is under, that we live in this scientific society with Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Hitchens and Dawkins spouting out this great era of evolution and science. And yet, in 1932, Huxley was telling you that science is strictly controlled. This is the end of the free half of Jay's analysis, esoteric look at Huxley's Brave New World. If you enjoyed this talk, you can check my site, jaysanalysis.com, for more full lectures, free from status, Marxist brainwashing, and education, that you would get in the controlled establishment venues. jaysanalysis.com provides free lectures and paid full lectures for those who like to support independent thinking, classical metaphysics, etc., etc. So go to jaysanalysis.com and subscribe for $4.95 a month to help me out and to learn good stuff.